Chapter one, Victor starts his narration. One of the first things that we can say is that even before he starts trying to discover the secret of life and playing God and stuff like that, there's something about Victor's account that suggests he's quite self-centered. It's all about him, isn't it? He just comes across as a bit arrogant, quite proud. Look at his first sentence. My family is one of the most distinguished. Or look at the last paragraph of chapter one, where he's talking about Elizabeth. Look at how many times we find the words my or mine. These are called first person possessive pronouns. Look how many there are in that paragraph alone. 10. Everything's always about him. We're only getting little glimpses of it at the moment. His brilliance as a scientist hasn't been revealed to us or his tendency to push things beyond any moral limits to achieve glory through his accomplishments. But that pride and arrogance is kind of there, lurking beneath the tone of his narration, even at this stage. The word we could use for this pride and arrogance, the, the misplaced sense of self-importance, is hubris. Don't be afraid to use the word. It's a word people use sometimes to talk about the pride that Lucifer or Satan felt before his fall. An appropriate link, bearing in mind the references to Paradise Lost in the novel. The main thing we need to get from chapter one, though, is just how idyllic Victor's childhood was. It's as if his only recollections are of bursting forth into a world of joy, tenderness and love. He says, for instance, my mother's tender caresses and my father's smile of benevolent pleasure while regarding me are my first recollections. Maybe this Victor focused worship, he's even called their idol in the next sentence, could even account for the self-centeredness later in life. To be fair to Victor's parents, though, they seem pretty intent on doing a good job. Victor says, during every hour of my infant life, I received a lesson of patience, of charity, and of self-control. All this is a far cry, of course, from the early experiences of the creature Frankenstein himself creates. Part of the reason we're presented with Victor's childhood in this chapter is so that we can contrast it with the first experiences of the creature in chapter five. Picture the love and devotion with which Victor's parents gaze on their newborn son, and then look at how Victor responds to his creation in his father role. He says this, I beheld the wretch, the miserable monster whom I had created, the demoniacal corpse to which I had so miserably given life. Hardly kuchi kuchi ku, is it? The other point you need to make, though, if you're writing about this, is that Shelley is using Victor's narration of this to set up this image of bliss, joy and stability for another structural reason, so that she can shatter it later. It's a bit like the opening of a film where you see a happy family doing happy family things, but you know, because you've seen the trailer, that it's not going to last. You know the happiness will be destroyed. Tragedy is just waiting to happen, and it's Victor's tragic flaw, his hubris, which will ultimately destroy him and everyone in his family. Shelley, through Victor, is presenting us with a before and after here. We've had a glimpse of the after in the image of Victor when Walton rescues him in letter four. But now we're being treated to the full heart-rending account of how his own choices led to the destruction of his family. There's a kind of suspense in this, in that whilst we know to expect death and misery, we don't quite know how it all unfolds. And the suspense and the tension is in the unfolding. The other aspect of the first chapter that's interesting is how women are portrayed. The way that Elizabeth is described here is a typical example. Women in Frankenstein are generally portrayed as quite passive. They seem to be there to serve some secondary functional role within the action, which actually centers on men. They rarely speak and often become victims. This might seem quite surprising, bearing in mind who Mary Shelley's mother was, Mary Wollstonecraft, an advocate of women's rights 
probably best known for writing A Vindication on the Rights of Woman, a feminist text very much before its time in 1792. So what's the daughter of Wollstonecraft doing writing about such weak passive characters? Well, maybe she's just presenting an honest image of women's roles and status in 19th century society. Maybe she's being realistic. Maybe she's saying that if the deluded men listened a bit more to the women condemned to a life of silence and passivity, the world might be a better place. Most importantly, though, chapter one is about foreshadowing, preparing us for the impending doom. Let's look at the last sentence of the chapter where Victor is talking about Elizabeth. No word, no expression could body forth the kind of relation in which she stood to me my more than sister, since till death she was to be mine only. Look at the use of repetition in the phrase, no word, no expression. Shelley is emphasising that Victor's emotional bond with Elizabeth is so great that it's beyond words. It's a bond so dear and precious because Shelley knows that it will later be ripped apart by a monster of his own creation. Look at the reference to death preparing us for Elizabeth's fate. But my favourite phrase is body forth. What a strange phrase to use, body forth. It's surely hinting at the idea of birth and creation that is such a central image in the novel and hinting that it's Victor's meddling in birth and creation which will cause the destruction of those dearest to him. 